I would be remiss in my duty if I did not tell you that the idea of intercourse, the fact of your firm young body co-mingling with the zombie take out makes me want to vomit. What's up? Welcome to episode 412 of Zombie Takeout, Zombie Takeout. the B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got some news. This is from Nerdist. John Boyega's had recent Attack the Block sequel discussions. So John, Bo- John Boyega has been making headlines recently due to his incredibly powerful speeches uh, during the Black Lives Matter protests in London. And he's also... Um, may have some. He also may have some exciting acting news to share in the not too distant future. Attack the Block director Joe Cornish chatted with Script Apart podcast The Empire for a recent interview. He discussed the possibility of a sequel to the sci-fi comedy horror film, saying, "Quote: We've got ideas. I, I met with John a couple of months ago to talk about it. We've always had ideas after the first one, but obviously we've both been doing." busy doing very different things. Uh, Cornish went on to explain that ever since Attack the Block came out, they have talked about what a sequel would look like, saying, quote, in a way, the longer you leave it, the more interesting it is. He also explained, um, so that's all I'll say. Um, uh, when asked about the question, uh, when asked the question if there would be a sequel in 2019, Boyega told Entertainment Weekly, quote, if the supporters want it, then I'll have to go back to Peckham, Peckham ASAP. Um, he tweeted about Cornish's recent sta- uh, statements as well, saying, quote, I think I'm going to need a whole, uh, the whole of London as an army on this one. Um, <laughs> I have, uh, I normally would say no to a sequel nearly 10 years later. Attack the Block was 2012. Um, oh, fuck, it was really that long ago? It was 2012, but I oh love God. Attack the Block. Um, I don't know where they would go. I mean, unless the aliens attack again and Moses once again just happens to be there. I, I'm yeah. curious. But It's kind of a diehard thing then, huh? Where, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Same guy again? Really? Um, but Boyega needs to shake Finn. <laughs> Going back to Moses, I think, is a good move. And it plays well with his you know, the press he's gotten for the protests. Um, it'll be a couple of years away, obviously, because nobody's going to be making movies in, in the you know near well, future. Yeah. I kind of found it wild to hear about movies and things, you know, in process or, or mm-hmm. well, it's in talks. So it's, yeah. it's in talks. Are you into it? You know, so we can set it up for when we can actually make movies again. <laughs> I, I am surprised he's sticking with the sci-fi thing and not moving out, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see him branch out, but I, I, I'm a sucker for Attack the Block. I'd love to see more. And, you know, like I said, shake Finn. <laughs> you know, like Kylo Ren, you know, kind of pushed out into to other things. But then again, but he, he was, was doing that beforehand. He was never, he wasn't a sci-fi guy before. He was well-established before Star Wars. Adam that's Driver. true. That is. So, and he was a not a sci-fi guy. So, you know, he's just going back to his normal thing. Um. So, yeah, I'm curious to see that. Anyway, on to this week's movie, which is from 1971, Harold and Maude. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by the Jaguar Hearse, new for 1971. All the performance you've come to expect from a Jaguar, Jaguar with the somber look of a hearse, and with only a little less carrying capacity. Try one at your next funeral. And also brought to you by Maude's Car Sharing Service. It's nice to have a variety of experiences. Paint not included. Hmm. All right, so we have a young man, fortunately not too young. He's 23, folks. Bud Court was, I think, 22 or 23 when the movie was made. He looks 12. Yeah, yeah, he looked super young, and it was like kind of like... Hmm. Um, but anyway, um, he's um, living with his mom, and um, she is just... Um, well, she's kind of oblivious, but... 
he apparently has put up so many antics that that he has made her, I guess, numb to his <laughs> work. He likes faking his own death. Yes, he uh, performance art of suicide uh, scenarios in the house, in the yard. Um, and it's, it's so matter of fact that they, you know, they're almost trauma quality, yeah, you know, yeah. scenes. She doesn't she, react to, to any of them until he messes up her bathroom with fake blood for one. And then she's like, okay, that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> until, until she makes a mess, then he's gone too far. Um, and, uh, well, it's all about straightening this kid out. Really, if you sum up the different things, mm. uh, you have the mom that uh, believes in the materialism. Uh, she sends him to the shrink, who, of course, I mean, I guess, you know, Freudian, you know, psychotherapy. Yeah, very Freudian. It was in the early 70s. And, um, or she tries to send him to his uncle, who, of course, is the military guy. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm trying to remember, there's one other, oh, yes, the priest, who will, mm-hmm. tries to talk some sense into him, too. Yeah. But in reality, um, well, he has this pre-fight club thing about going to funerals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'm surprised no one called out fight club for ripping this yeah. that whole shtick off. <laughs> it's just they were doing Harold and Maude with, in fact, did we do fight club and we should have had a Harold and Maude title to it. I, I don't, I have, if we did, and I don't remember if we ever viewed Fight Club, I'll have to check when we're done recording. I know, but it's I, a problem we re- review like over 400 and something yeah. movies. <laughs> but I hadn't really seen, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'd seen Harold Maud before today. Uh, if I had, oh. it was many years ago and I'd forgotten about it, so. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, they both enjoy going to different funerals. He uh, meets an old elderly woman at one of the funerals. Right, and they is uh, is this elderly woman who also enjoys going to funerals. Not as respectful as Harold at the funeral. She she doesn't mind making a scene or hissing at somebody to get someone's attention. Um, and uh, she she pretty much seeks him out. You know, uh, they both share a common interest. Uh, <laughs> they so uh, she invites him over. They, it's a uh, meet cute. It's a meet cute with a 79 year old woman and a 23 year old guy who looks 12 at a funeral. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she is pretty much just the free spirit of just do what makes you happy. Um, don't worry about what other people think and uh, go for as many experiences as possible. No. But she also pushes it too far. Yeah. <laughs> He's kind of caught between these two extremes. Right, and um, they, they well, she pushes it too far because she has see, they imply that she has seen some extreme shit. <laughs> yeah, she steals cars on the reg- on the regular. But they they imply that you know they they make references to two of the worst cases of anti semitism in like the same scene, you know, where yeah, yeah. she's talking about somebody being imprisoned. And mm-hmm. then glance down and just casually see the the number tattoos from Auschwitz yeah. on her her arm. Right. And uh, so, yes, they build a uh, they. It turns into a romantic relationship, and um, hmm, I don't know if I could say hilarity ensues or if I just go all the way with it. Yes. Yeah, let's go all the way. There, there will be spoilers in this. Let's just say that. Because I don't think we can talk about this movie without spoiling the ending. You're probably right, because the ending is just, I mean, it's just a big part of the film. It's so, free um, on 2B, so if you haven't seen it, pause and go watch now. So, right, he, you know, he pretty much has the moment of clarity where this is, I mean, his mom had been trying to fix him up with women and telling him to marry so he gets the bright idea, why don't I marry Maud, this elderly woman who's turning 80, and it'll be part of her 80th birthday, despite the fact that she says, I believe on two occasions. That, Before this, yes. That, <laughs> that She's not her, going to live past her 80th birthday. Right. Her 80th birthday is it. And even said that that's enough. I've lived enough. I don't need to go any further than that. 
and uh, he just he I think it was before he really knew her mm-hmm. when he when she was saying it like the first right. or second time. So I think he kind of dismissed it. I just figured she didn't expect to live that much longer. You know, it caught me off guard too. And uh, you saw it coming a mile away when he's ready to pop the question. Uh, she pretty much just flat out says, huh, I took the tablets. Uh, I don't, I'm probably not going to make it to midnight. <laughs> and then we can she say hilarity, hilarity ensues. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, the start of the movie is something very interesting as a former smoker. Harold is lighting these candles at this kind of altar sort of thing. He has a lighter, one of those big desk lighters, that he uses to light a match to light the candle. I mean, the the, the lighter was big, but he picked it up. Why not just use the lighter? <laughs> Why do you need the match? <laughs> it's kind of an either-or thing. Um, and he, they really don't wait for the suicide attempt. or the, the, I will not say suicide attempts, but they suicide stagings right in that first scene within minutes he's hanging himself i I had forgotten about all these gags actually i don't know how i forgot about some of these things you think they'd be pretty memorable but the first thing Mm -hmm. i was thinking of was whoa if you didn't like the if you didn't like the stuff from last week (laughs) (laughs) how are you gonna feel about this And yeah, it, it just catches you off guard. And then as he's hanging there, his mother walks in, ignores it. Just kind of goes about her business. She sees him, but she just yeah. goes about her business. That's the point I said I'm in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, I, a little later in the movie, he buys a hearse. I love that. He's obsessed with death. Right. He is. He uh, he might have been the first goth. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I'm trying to because the of... scene goes back to like the late seventies, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure it has roots before then, like everything. But you know, goth is not. I mean, you have different kinds of goths. You have the people who are just into the music and the clothes. But really, at its core, it's about accepting death. Well, right, uh, I, and. Yeah, again, it is about living your life versus... It's, it's memento mori. You know, yeah. remember you're going to die. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this and this movie is really just a big memento mori. But, you know, um, I have I have the actor's name, Harold, I, there he is, um, is really Bud just... Bud was it? Bud Court is the actor, yeah. He's obsessed with death. Um, so he's constant... And he's also feeling very ignored by his mother. So he's constantly faking his own death for attention, or at least that's what it seems like at first. He's trying to shock her to get her to, to like to, to get the impre- to get an idea that she cares. You kind of feel at like least that was my interpretation uh, at that point. Just to piss her off. Uh, I mean, I don't know. It... <laughs> yeah. Um. But I love that he bought a hearse. Um. I the love that the with sort the of. Hearse. Yeah. Yeah. And the sort of abject terror on his face when he's talking to the shrink and the priest. <laughs> he looks like he just saw someone die. <laughs> it, it looks like he's uh, in the wrong movie. Like he should be in The Exorcist yeah. when he's yeah. talking with them. <laughs> or just he's in the wrong movie. Like he wasn't supposed to be in that scene and he can't figure out why he's in that scene and it's just <laughs> happening. <laughs> Which I guess is kind of how it is. Like, why the fuck am I talking to these weirdos? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Not sure how I feel about the prosthetic arm on his uncle, the military guy, being played for a laugh. He was the right-hand man of uh, MacArthur. It's 71, so I mean, you know, it, they were insensitive at the you know, time, so I'm not going to take it away, take away from it, but yeah. Um, well, the fact that they're doing this in the middle of the Vietnam War. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> very close to the end, but I think it was still going on. Oh, there's still a few years left of the Vietnam War, uh-huh. so it's you know, I mean, like that is that is balls of steel to be <laughs> yeah, sure. about the military in the middle of a war like this. But they kind of go on a bit of analysis restaurant tangent with it later. Yeah, the second scene with his uncle really goes Alice's restaurant, 
where you know um arlo is you know jumping up and down and screaming i'm gonna i want to kill i want to kill and is shown out that's right this came like after yeah alice's <laughs> restaurant quite a bit um but I, but then, you know, he goes to the, his second funeral, the film, I think it was. He sees her at his first funeral, an outdoor yeah. one, kind of fascinated by her. And then he goes to the second funeral, and she just kind of starts chatting him up. Yeah, she kind of scares funeral. him at the first funeral. Mm-hmm. Um, that that second scene with um, MacArthur's right-hand man. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I, I, that, for the record, I'm shaking my head. <laughs> that, <laughs> That uh, that tactic they use, of course, would totally not have worked. <laughs> of course, <laughs> the, he would have totally been into it. <laughs> I would have had no problem with him killing a protester. Oh yeah, the later scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, she starts chatting him up. I love the contrast because he is quiet and creepy, and she's just really bright. Yeah. Um, Just, uh, oh, well, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> and then she steals the priest's car. <laughs> well, first she's, you know, she's driving off of the car and, you know, you know, they see the priest kind of mm-hmm. hustling to get out. And yeah, she offers him a ride out. home. He says, I've got my own car. She, she goes off and then yeah, the priest walks out and yeah, she stole his car. <laughs> and then his mother decides she's going to try to set him up with women from a dating service. Oh, Which man. is an ongoing gag throughout the movie. Yeah. But when she tells him this and she starts filling out the profile for him. And she's answering the questions. Yeah, for him. And he opens his case that's on his lap, takes out a gun, <laughs> starts slowly loading it, points it at her for a second, then points it at himself. I'm guessing it I'm guessing it was a starter pistol pistol. Yeah. So pulls the trigger. The cherries in falls back. She's like, Harold, get up. Just got quit messing around. <laughs> now, of course, my favorite suicide staging, mm-hmm. without a doubt, was the self ventilation. <laughs> it's so subtle. I loved that scene. <laughs> like, um, like as soon as I saw the robes, I was like, oh, damn, is he going to? Oh, my God. Yeah, that's a cattle cow fluid. <laughs> His mother is interviewing the first prospective date from the dating service and out the window at the, on the mother's shot, you see someone, a, a human like shape covered in these white ra- rags or white cloth. Well, he walks and, by and kind of waves in the window. Okay. I didn't catch that. To get her attention. But he's wearing like these white robes. Uh-huh. <laughs> didn't, I missed that part. But then, yeah, you see this character in like this human shape in white robes. And I didn't know I didn't put it yeah, together he until the walks the to the second... platform, covers himself with the robe, which of course is when he pulls the switcheroo and gets out of there. This is all in the distant background <laughs> in one of a two shot, one half of a two shot, yes, or a two person sh- scene, you know, back and forth shot. So I didn't catch that. I only caught it the next time, and then I'm <laughs> the second time I saw him, I'm like, wait, is he gonna? <laughs> and he did. <laughs> Oh man, that was uh, that that had me rolling. <laughs> like, yeah, I think that might be the point where I actually laughed out loud. Um, oh yes, <laughs> I definitely was. Um, but then you know he comes back in after it because the date sees the body burning and screams. He walks in, which confused the hell out of me. Right, we pulled the switcheroo. He, he walked by, so. yeah, yeah, right. put it, covered himself with the thing, right. the ropes. <laughs> I guess he couldn't. There's no way he could fake burning himself. So, yeah, he, he had to have used a dummy. Yeah. Um, but he walks in, and the girl is screaming. The mother's like, oh, fuck off, Howard. Or Harold. <laughs> doesn't say that, but that's her tone. Yeah. He gives this look to the camera and this slow smile that's just incredibly fucking creepy. Um, but apparently, Bud Court improvised that. <laughs> That was not scripted. Um, before that, I do. I loved um, Maud's line: "How how the world de- still dearly loves a cage." Yeah. You know, she was talking about prison, and what was the other one? Oh, animals being in oh, zoos and prisons. She was right. comparing zoos and prisons, and yeah, said, said how the oh how the world still dearly loves a cage. 
Um, and well, and that, that does sum a lot of the, the movie up. It is oh, her yeah, yeah. about breaking from mm-hmm. societal norms that, that yeah. are just crushing people. Mm-hmm. Loves the odorifics. She has this invention where she it's this tube of a, a smell that she puts in a, in a device. You put a mask up to your face and you get this smell that's in the tube. Reminded me of something almost out of UHF. Yes. Or uh, matinee, you know? Something yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then there was her statue. She, oh. has this, she shows him this statue that she created that she said was is tactile art. You have to touch it. It's a giant vagina. <laughs> she asks him what else he likes to do for fun other than going to funerals. And next, in the next shot, they're watching a building be demolished. As a Mythbusters fan, I totally understand the appeal of watching a building get demolished. Watching things get broken is fun. You know, I don't think I've ever uh, actually watched one. Um, I, yeah, I, I've seen, obviously Mythbusters, they blow up things, blow things up a lot. Yeah, yeah, I've seen a few buildings get demolished. Not not live, but, you know, video. Um, there's just fun about, there's just a, a, something fun about seeing some, a big thing get broken. Um, <laughs> I think it's because, like, as a kid, your first sense of power is when you knock the blocks over. I, I guess so. You know, it's that it's the first thing you, you, you feel like you have some control in the world is knocking over these blocks. It's it's kind of feeds into that. Um, another great line from Maud uh, shortly after that scene. She says, um, I feel that the world uh, much of the, I feel that much of the world's sorrow comes from people who are like this, who are this. She gestures to some daisies, yet allow themselves to be treated as that and gestures to the building they just watched get destroyed. Oh, I thought it, she was gesturing to the uh, this the headstones. Oh, okay. I, I assume the the, the building because uh, you know people who are you know flowers these delicate flowers, but allow themselves to be broken. The and, camera you know, abused. pans back, and and they're just in this thing of just a bunch yeah. of, of could have uh, been a cemetery and a bunch of it uh, could have been the headstones. I was I assuming since they just watched the building, I, I thought it was that, but now. The, the entire score from the film, or this film, or soundtrack score, or whatever you want to call it, is all Cat Stevens music. I've never been a big fan of his, but it fits the movie. I It kind of distracts, I feel, from it. I mean, I, I agree, it, thematically it works, but it's like the same thing as, um, what was it, Slapshot? <laughs> Where yeah. it was just like so repetitive, it was kind of like, what? I mean, is this... Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I had one to artist the the whole. I had to do the math. Cat Stevens at the time had about sixty songs in his entire catalog. Uh-huh. Nine songs were used in this movie. Ah, okay. Fifteen <laughs> percent of his fucking catalog. Yeah. Uh huh. Now, shortly after that scene, uh, she meant they're talking. She's talking about her past. She mentions that she's from Vienna. Right. Where's her accent? Because she she attended pro. She's saying she attended protests in Vienna. I mean, she, you know, she was young in Vienna and all that. If she would have an accent if she was, you know, a teenager or older when she left. I I'd rather her yeah. just not than try a bad one though. Yeah, fair. I mean, if she said she was British, I might buy it. Right. Ruth Gordon did have that that kind of you know mid Atlantic accent. Um, Wasn't she from Jersey? <laughs> I don't know. I forgot to check. Um, she looked good for 75, I gotta say. Mm. Um, she was 75, not 79 when the movie was Yeah, in. yeah. Um, also, he, he, you know, she's trying to get him to pick up an instrument um, because she, she loves music. She gives him a banjo. She says, <laughs> you know, try playing a chord on it. Now, most people wouldn't pick up on this. The thing about banjo, it's tuned to a chord. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a G. It's tuned to like I think it's a G chord. So okay. all you got to do is either strum it open or put bar any fret. You're playing a chord. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Um, I don't understand why he and then of, said to the girl that he was learning to play the harmonica instead of the banjo. I loved that because banjo is kind of embarrassing. You know, banjo is not a cool instrument. I've become kind of enamored with it because of Noam Pekelny from Punch Brothers. He's incredible. 
um, Bella Fleck a little bit before that. I, would I guess Steve Martin's love it. done a lot for it too. Yeah. And I mean, even back in the seventies with his comedy, but even more recently right, as right. a serious musician playing bluegrass. I, I'd even um, forgotten that he, he was doing that back in the seventies yeah. with his comedy. But, Hell but of yeah. a player. I mean, not yeah. on the Bella Fleck and Pekelney level, but still very good. Yeah. Um, but it's still kind, it's not a cool instrument. You know, banjo is, has that weird t- sound that can be very annoying to a lot of people. Um, <laughs> I would love one, but they typically weigh like 12 pounds, not very comfortable to play. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, but, but I, I, I did love the, you know, he starts to say banjo. He actually plays harmonica. Um, <laughs> but before that, after the scene, after she gives him the banjo, um, there's the scene where his mother bought him a present. She's leading him out to it. You know, it's obviously going to be a car. It's this beautiful Jag. Right. You're he, not expecting he, a Jag. <laughs> yeah. He he thanks her for it, you know, plays along. She goes, he walks off off frame, comes back with a welding torch lit. I loved the expression on his face when he had the <laughs> torch. I, you don't know what he's going to do at that point. You find out a right, couple of scenes. Right, you're kind of like, oh, go, is he just going to mangle this jack? Yeah. <laughs> you don't know what he's going to do. A couple of scenes later, you, you see his handiwork. He turned it into a fucking hearse. A jag hearse, which was just fucking amazing actually it's the it, it may be the one car that's cooler than the monster mobile <laughs> and then we get to the pro war scene the scene where he's talking with his uncle because she decided she's had enough of his shit and she sent she's you know sending him off to, to join the military um both funny and horrifying right and his uncle's totally- part would not have worked. <laughs> well, no, the uncle scene before that. Oh, wow. um, when he the uncle was talking about the benefits of war. It was it was so straight faced, so um, dry that I almost it's almost it's played very very straight. It's yeah. super dry comedy, and it's horrifying and funny at the same time. And then he starts getting overexcited about war in a very Alice's restaurant kind of way. I want to kill. I want to kill. I want to kill. Um, Maud shows up as this protester, and there's this whole shtick that supposedly was was a, intended to, to drive the, the his, his uncle away and make him make his uncle think he's too crazy to join the military. Um, during this whole you know fake fight, she falls through this hole in the, the the floor of where they are into the water. That caught me off guard. Right, I wasn't expecting that either. Like what? I, I didn't know if that was part of the plan or, or what, you know, next scene they show him together. He tells her he loves her. I like how slowly he fell for her. It made sense. Yeah. Oh yeah, it did. It, Cause I mean, at first, it like crazy old lady. Oh, yeah. nice. You know, I can, I'm, you know, experiencing new things and then, yeah. Mm-hmm. But it, it made, it made sense that this guy in his early twenties fell for this 80 year old woman. It, it just, that was a great magic trick. Cause I, I, I knew that was going to happen. I know enough, I knew right. enough about the movie to, that that was coming. You do. I did not know right. how, I did not know. Well, no, even before just knowing the plot, I, I, well, knew, yeah. I knew what to expect and I had no idea how they were going to pull that off. Um, but it worked. Um, it's definitely the one thing, you know, going into this movie is that, you know, these two are hooking up. Yeah. Um, now the Harry Carey scene, I have very mixed feelings about, and I, and I say it as Harry Carey very intentionally. Um, he's meeting one of the prospective date, uh, dates, and and he, she sees these antique knives, and apparently she's really into knives. Got to love her for that. I actually, kind of love this date. I, I I was kind of rooting for her. But yeah, um, you kind of like wonder why he didn't like because <laughs> he was already in love with with Maud. Um, other, if it wasn't for Maud, she'd have been perfect for him. Yeah. Um, he shows her you know, these antique knives, and he says, and, and bear in mind, I'm an anime geek. I am a borderline weeaboo. Um, so, you know, I, I've been studying Japanese, blah, blah, blah. Um, he says one of them is a Harry Carey blade. <laughs> it's It was a tanto that was sometimes used for seppuku. Um, have to nitpick that. Um, but I he, he fakes seppuku. I can't decide if that was racist or not. Ah, uh, you know what I loved though—the fact but that he the, 
the part where he moves his tie. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, he doesn't like you know say anything in mock Japanese or anything. Right, he just, right. He just sticks himself in the stomach with this you know folding blade, and and kind of fell falls forward. Um, I'm going to be the white guy that says it was not racist, and uh, and here's the reason it, why. I'm, okay, okay. I'm I'm probably being a little too critical. Go ahead. He, he he stages every form of suicide there is. True, true, and that and is, is, is a well known form of suicide. Right. Fair point. Fair point. And he doesn't. He doesn't. He calls it Harry Carey, which again at the time was what it was called, was right. known of in the, known as in the West. The old um, announcer for the Chicago Cubs. Yes, I always think of that too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, he doesn't like mock any Japanese. He doesn't like right. put on a headband. It's none of there's none of that shit. Which so, honestly, I for seventy one, that's damn impressive. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think in seventy one, that would be required. Well, yeah, you right. got to make fun of it, right? It's so I guess it's okay. But what I loved was right after that, he goes face down and the, the perspective dates launches into Romeo and Juliet. Yes. An actor. I love that and she appreciated the performance too, which yeah. I mean, you, you'd got to appreciate his performances. They mm-hmm. are fucking amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and while she's going through the Juliet's death scene, he just kind of turns his head as he's laying there like, what the fuck? <laughs> she out creeped him. <laughs> uh, we missed a part, though. We missed. Okay. We missed the part of uh, Tom Skerritt. Okay, where was he? He was the cop, of course. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yes. The cop. <laughs> I, yeah, I wonder how I many cops so. he's played in his career that were right, right, right. He's always the sheriff of somewhere. Or, mm-hmm. and this time he's the motorcycle cop. Um, she gets pulled over, and you know he she admits she had just stolen a tree. Um, they they she decided they needed to rescue this tree that was on a sidewalk somewhere in the city. They um, breathe car, you know, CO two, and mm-hmm. uh, they so they. they get choked out in the part of the forest that they uh, planted in mm-hmm. but you know <laughs> you know they so they rescue the tree rescue in quotes in a stolen um el camino yeah that that gets pulled over she admits the el camino was stolen and then they they stole the tree from the city and they're gonna go plant it in the woods well right she uh she would never lie about something just no, like, no. Oh, yeah, this is what i did and then um, she managed to it manages to evade the cop by driving circles around him, causing his bike to fall over. <laughs> I love that they brought him back later. Yes, he he actually does. He pulls her over again. I forget how she got out of it the second time. She stole his bike. Oh, she's right. right she stole his bike. Of <laughs> well, while he went in to the El Camino, mm-hmm. she got on the bike, and they uh... yeah. Drive off. Yeah. This is why I say she took it to I was kind of on her side until I really thought about the stealing cars thing. Because I'm <laughs> all for following your bliss. As I said to someone on Twitter recently, you know, as long as no one gets hurt, I will always encourage shenanigans of any kind. But when you're stealing cars, you're hurting people. You know, <laughs> that that's too far. Um, she She's kind of objectivist. She returned the car when she could. Fair. But she's very objectivist. I almost—I wanted to come up with a title that mentioned Ayn Rand. Couldn't think of any. Um, it was like the priest said, uh, you know, like she painted the, the, the painting the statues. Yeah, um, she just takes it a little too far. Otherwise, I would have been totally on board with her. Um, <laughs> oh, one thing I forgot to mention about the scene—the sepulchre scene. His mother walks in while the date is you know, like bloody. After she had finished her Juliet scene. He's standing there with the knife, and she thinks he he killed her. (laughs) (laughs) And then we get to the priest, the scene we referenced in the intro. Yeah. It was supposed to be funny, but it was really just upsetting. (laughs) I I mean, come on. All I could think of was Finster and Sons. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, fair, fair point. (laughs) This, This go back. Yeah, um, linger longer. Um, the, um, <laughs> the, 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 the level of 
uh, loathing and mm-hmm. lustfulness, though, that yeah. he delivered that line. Yeah. Oh, just, so the delivery was perfect. I have no had criticisms me of the actor. Had rolling. <laughs> I have no criticisms of the actor. Abs- quite the contrary. It was a brilliant performance. It just upset me. <laughs> Um, for the Finster and Sons reference, zombietakeout.com on the side, you'll see TAS question mark. It's our first podcast, the Tuesday afternoon show. I believe it was episode seven. It's all just commercial oh parodies. Oh my God, you remember that? I, I think it, I want to say it was seven. I have no idea what the title was. I want to say it was episode seven. Um, was that but it's the all ad parodies. John? I, no, that wasn't that. I think it was all, but it was all ad parodies. Um, I, I wrote a, a investment banker parody called Finster and Sons that Scott did a dead on perfect um, John Hasman for. Yeah. Um, I lo- back to Harold and Maud. I loved the organic <laughs> jokes. A um, couple of scenes, there's this wine that she's pouring for him and he doesn't drink. But she says, that's okay. It's organic. And he laughs. <laughs> Love that. I mean, there is organic or- wine out there now. <laughs> but it was so ahead of its time. Right, because it was a shot at organic. Organic is marketing bullshit. It means nothing. <laughs> well, there are guidelines that you uh, have to follow. It's it's so it's so meaningless though. But you know, yeah, it has right. a mean. It has been watered down. It's no, marketing it's bullshit at this point. Yeah, and and then we get to the scene that really was when I realized I am not on her side. She kills herself because she decided 80 was enough. Um, Did not see it coming. You saw it coming a mile away. I didn't. Well, she, she opened. I, mean, I know she, she telegraphed it. it. <laughs> she, she, I mean, not I even still... telegraphed. She came right out and said, oh yeah, that that's going to be it for me after Saturday. I I'm still done. didn't think it was going to be a suicide. <laughs> I just didn't think she expected to live much longer. Um, Some people say that she had the uh, she might have had dementia, like oncoming, and mm, uh, decided that they should have made that clear. Yeah, I didn't see any. I don't recall any signs uh, about that. Yeah, I'm not going to shame a suicide. You know, I'm not. Th- I'm not going to go there when it's you know out of pain or you know you know assisted suicide for euthanasia, um, or or just you know depression, anxiety, mental illness, one of those kind of suicides. I'm not going to shame it. She, on the other hand, just decided that was it. She had <laughs> there was no mention head. of illness. Right. Um, horribly selfish. Um, the most selfish. I mean, suicide is selfish, but when it comes out of pain, it's understandable. Um, so yeah, he has this, the appropriate response of what? <laughs> yeah. Um, has a breakdown. Yeah. Drives his car off a cliff. One last suicide to a stage. I love that the car didn't explode when it hit. Thank <laughs> you for that. I think they really did it. I, I, oh, yeah, actually, that looked, I think that's what would actually have happened to that car. I think that's I think that's just what happened to the car when it landed. Right. They I, I read it, about it. it when S over when S over N landed on its top and just crushed. They uh because people always want to know like what happened to the Jag hearse. And because mm-hmm. you know people were, were willing to pay like good money for it, of course, because it was fucking hot. Uh, I'm, I'm but, surprised there was only one. Usually there are multiples in situations. But yeah, like this. they they only made one, and they fucking <laughs> drove it off the cliff. Drove it off the cliff. So, I mean, the parts were probably split among the crew for you know um, souvenirs. But um, and then we get the fake out. He did. He wasn't in the car. Yeah, well, he just I walks mean, off. He walks off with his banjo playing. If you want to sing out, I mean, he couldn't have really killed himself. Of course, it yeah. was just another staged suicide. You right. know, it, it was the last one in the whole right. series of staged suicides. He'd and done everything it was up until that point. Destroying the hearse, which means I think he was over that phase. Yeah, and, and Maud's life. Over that phase. Maud's life and death would have been meaningless if he had gone yeah. out in it. So it would have right, really right. It would have been horrific if he had just right, decided right. to end it there. Um, on a sequels and remix. Well, I guess they could remake it. Um, writer producer Colin Higgins expressed interest in 1978 about both a sequel and a prequel to Harold Mod. The sequel, Harold's st- story, would have court portraying Harold's life after Mod. Uh, Higgins also imagined a prequel showing Mod's life before Harold. 
Grover and Maud had Maud learning how to steal cars from Grover Muldoon, the character portrayed by Richard Pryor in Higgins 76 film Silver Streak. Higgins <laughs> wanted Gordon and Pryor to reprise their roles. Wow. That was weird. <laughs> Harold's story, eh, we kind of get it. I think, you know, seeing him walk off, you know, moving on from that phase of his life was enough. Right. A, a happy, better adjusted yeah. person going out to society. Well, no, that was not really happy, but, you know, better adjusted perhaps. Um, Harold, Grover and Har- Maude? No. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'll say respect happy. to Richard Pryor, but. I say happy, but I mean, it is that he, he's ready to live life now rather than just yeah. fixate right. on death. Right. Um, also, in addition, after the film came out, the script was turned into a novel and then a play, which ran for several years in Paris. So there is also a stage version. <laughs> I, uh, you know, why don't they do something where they uh, change the genders like they do with other remakes now? <laughs> Two, no, it's that would be a young woman and an old man would be too common anyway. That wouldn't raise any eyebrows. Uh, I kid, I kid. Um, You know, obviously you get Helen Mirren. Uh Yeah, um, I and I always have this problem. I can never think of uh, young actors. Um, um, I can't think of a twenty early twenties actor offhand. I don't see enough modern movies. Um, I don't know what what sold this was Bud Court's. You know, yeah, you can't replace responses. Bud Court in that role. Um, I can't think of anybody who could do that. Um, like the eyes just bugging out of the head at some yeah. scenes. You're just like, wow. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was made for him. Um, on the brains. On the brains. I'm going five, but as I mentioned to you before we recorded, this is a Black Rainbow five. Um, I deeply respect this movie. It has made me think more than a movie has probably since Primer. Um, <laughs> but I I don't know if I liked it. Um, I'm going four and a half. I, I do. I did really like it a lot. Um, I think it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a philosophy, mm-hmm. but. Um, I think too much Cat Stevens was a little bit of a distraction. I think uh-huh. if you just maybe did three Cat Stevens songs, maybe you know, if you have if you off. you know if you liked Cat Stevens more, my life my life would be a lot easier tonight. <laughs> Posting on the website <laughs> yeah, on the rec list. Um, all right, so what have we learned? Uh, we learned that black flowers are just dead, and I learned that everyone's got a right to make an ass out of themselves. That line reminded me so much of Arthur Waldman. Oh. <laughs> you know, acting class, but he said to be an actor, you have to be willing to make an ass of yourself. That, that is true. That is true. Um, all right. So that's it for Harold and Maude. Until next time, when we'll be reviewing The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. I have seen that, but it has been ages. So I'm very curious to see how it's going to age. It's been a little while, I think. I've seen it a few times. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.